Who are you? Blue and Spam. We're bleed and blue with, with you. Let's go, Blues! Let's go, Blues! Let's go, Blues! And aloha! Welcome to the Blue Note Fan Report. I'm Guy, the Y Blues fan, and I'm your host on the only program out there that's by a fan, for a fan, and you gotta know all about you, the fan! Well, today I have two very, very special guests. I'm gonna bring my first one on. This is my buddy, my mentor from the Drop Hockey Podcast. Lance to Scott. Lance, welcome to the Blue Note Fan Report. Well, it's great to be on, Guy. I appreciate you asking me to come in on this episode. I'm really looking forward to talking hockey with you and, of course, your special guest today. I'm not going to ruin it. I'm going to let you say who it is. But uh, those of us who grew up watching the Blues in the 70s, uh, early 80s, definitely know this man and definitely have great memories of him and a Blue Note. We have, we have actually – I mean, this guy is – if if, if uh, Bob Plager wasn't Mr. Blue, this guy could be considered Mr. Blue. He played with the Blues from 77. All right, let me make sure I get this right. 78, from 78, 70, or 79 until 83. He was there during the best and worst of times. Drafted by the Blues in 75, I think it was. 73, I think. 70, uh, I think it was 73 or 74, 79 overall. 74, 79th overall, fifth round, and, and he is just a wonderful man. Please, please welcome to my show, Mr. Mike Liute, or Mike Zook. I'm sorry. <laughs> Mike, welcome to the show. That's all right. It happens all the time. Oh, man. I, I apologize about that. <laughs> no problem at all. No oh. problem at all. No, Mike, thank you so much for showing up to the show. Me and Lance have been talking about this for a couple of days now since we had the technical difficulties, and he was like, oh, thank you so much for having him because now I can come on the show. Um, no, my pleasure. So, my pleasure. Yeah, so, so one of the things that I always like to ask my guests when they first come on is tell me about where you grew up and how you got into hockey, how, how, how hockey became such a love and, and basically a career for you. Well, I grew up in Sault Ste. Marie, Ontario, which is up in northern Ontario, Canada, right on the Great Lakes. And uh, actually, kind of a funny story. My my uncles all played hockey at a high level. And uh, people tell me if it wasn't for the Second World War, there might have been four of them in the NHL. They were that good. Wow. They were just rugged, uh, good hockey players. My dad actually was the youngest of all the brothers. He was a baseball player. He had a trial for the Detroit Tigers. And he only played hockey, you know, uh, backyard. Uh, you know, he didn't play at a high level where he could have made it. Might have made it a baseball, but didn't. Uh, someone else talked my dad into bringing me out for hockey. And he did that. And then uh, once I got started into it, he built a, an ice rink in my backyard. So I started skating. At about seven years old, and had a had a rink in my backyard uh, from my, when I was seven, and then when I left, my dad kept it open with for my brother, and then he had guys like Marty Turkle, Ron Francis, uh, Joe Thor, uh, Thornton. They actually all skated in my dad's rink, and that's where I got started. Did real well. My dad coached me. He was actually um, a person who started uh, who thought about skill development and skills before it was a popular thing to do. He actually read a book by a Russian coach who read a book from a Canadian coach and he took the Russians uh, viewpoint of skill development. And uh, that's all we did when we, when, uh, when he was coaching the skills, skills, skills. And I got to be a pretty good player, played a lot, had a rink in my backyard. I basically skated, every night from seven o'clock till 11 o'clock all winter and winter there is from November till April. Yeah. And I, I would imagine that they probably had to pull you into the house and, uh, 
it, it's it's great that you said that you were seven because you know I've talked to Grant Fuhrer and a lot of other guys uh, that played in the NHL, and seven is actually starting a little late for a guy yeah, that was, made it to yeah. the NHL. Uh, back then it wasn't that odd, but now I mean these kids are on uh, on the ice at three, four years three, old. Yep, yep. It's, it's crazy, but you know if the kid loves it, as long as the parents not pushing them, then uh, there's nothing wrong. With it. It's the best sport in the world. It is. Yes, it oh, is. I, I absolutely agree. So. As you're coming up through, you know, um, your high, your teenage years and when it's starting to look like, you know, you're you're getting better and better. Did you play um, junior hockey in Canada? Played one year junior um, as a senior in high school, and uh, the year that I fi- after I finished my my senior year, the Greyhounds, the home team, uh, went to the OHL. And I don't know if you know or your listeners know, but the OHL, you cannot have a scholarship. They yep. offer they offer scholarships in the OHL, but you can't go to a U.S. college if you play uh, major junior, they call it. So I had, a, I had to elect to pl- either go to college or stay in the Sioux, play junior, and forego my college eligibility. So I decided, even though Phil Esposito, who I knew well because he uh, ran a hockey school, every summer while I was a youngster and I went to school for six years in a row. So I knew him. He was part owner of the team. He wanted me to stay and play junior. They offered me an OHL scholarship, which is kind of a, it's, it's hard to explain. It's if you, if you want to accept the scholarship after you're done junior or a couple of years after you can, but if you turn pro your scholarship disappears. So I elected to take the scholarship. I had three offers, uh, Lake Superior state, which is across the river from the Sioux, Ontario, Notre Dame, or Michigan Tech. And uh, somehow or other, uh, Michigan Tech just felt like the the best suited uh, university for me, and it, it, it turned out it was. Yeah, and it, in fact, I probably a lot of people don't know this, but uh, they really look at you with, uh, with, uh, with a high opinion of you at uh, Minnesota Tech. You still own a lot of their records. Uh, I just read an article about you. I think it was in March of this year uh, or last March of last year, March uh, 26th. I think it came out and explained your career there, but you really had a deep impact on hockey there. Didn't you? Well, well, Michigan, we were, we had the best coach. Well, there were two really, really good coaches at the time. Uh, John McGinnis who coached uh, us. And then uh, Herb, Herb Brooks was the uh, coach at uh, Minnesota. And uh, we actually played each other three times in a row my uh, sophomore, junior, senior year for the NCAA championship. Yeah. We were and he beat you, what was it, six to four? four? He beat you in one of them six to four? Uh, we lost the first one, I think, four to one. Uh, my sophomore year, my junior year, we won in St. Louis, like seven yep. to one. Yep. And then my senior year, we lost to them in uh, Denver. I forget yep. what the score was. Yep. So, uh, but I played with a lot of really good players. Uh, Tech was uh, right up there, number one, two, as far as places to play college hockey. Uh, so we got a lot of good players, and uh, so I played with a lot of good players. Had had a pretty good career there. Uh, we were successful, so I was able to put up quite a few points. So uh, it, it was it was a good uh, four year run that I had uh, at Tech. Wow, I mean, well, just the the fact of playing or uh, knowing her Brooks. Uh, I, I got to ask, I mean, there, there's been two movies that portrayed the 80 Olympics. Uh, Carl Molden played him, and then it was, and I'm, my mind. Kurt Russell. Put, Kurt Russell. Kurt Russell. Right. So, of those, have, have you seen either one of those two movies? Oh, yeah. The Miracle movie was great. I mean, I the, watched it. Uh, uh, I played against most of those guys. Yep. Uh, none, of the, none of the guys from Michigan Tech made it, but. Uh, there was an overlap between those guys and uh, and most of those guys and us. Uh, The story they tell about uh, the fight between, was it McClanahan and uh, the guy from Boston and the guy from Minnesota, I forget. We were watching that game because that was the semifinal game. The winner of that played us for the championship. And it kind of seemed like the Minnesota guy went after their best player to take him out. I don't want to tell stories out of school here, but um, it looked like that's what happened. And Minnesota ended up winning that semifinal game and then met us in the finals. Yeah, there was a lot of guys on that team that uh, 
had to come together because they hated each other because they played against each other. Different oh, yeah. universities. Boston University was one of the universities that was represented very well on that team. Yeah. And uh, they really did not like each other. Oh, no, no, no. They didn't play <laughs> each other a lot. Maybe in yeah. tournaments they might have traveled. One of yeah. the teams might have traveled to the other to play. Uh, the only crossovers league-wise was in the, in the finals. And back then it was uh, it was just the WCHA, the yeah. Western Hockey League, and then the, uh, and I don't know what they called it out east. I think they might have had a play down between two leagues, but the WCHA at, back then was by far the best league. You know, that that the team that came out of there usually won the, the championship. It's, it's changed a lot over the years, but back then that's how it was. Wow, man. I'm just sitting here in awe of, of thinking about you knowing all those guys and playing with all those guys in the period that you played in, almost a golden era of college hockey. And we talked about this a little bit. So when you made the shift to the NHL, you actually came up against some roadblocks because a lot of coaches in the NHL didn't trust the guys from the college game. Right. Well, yeah, I, um, I, turned, I got drafted in 72 turned pro in 76. I, I finished my career. They, you know, the w, WHA was still in existence, but they had turned down the bidding for players later on because it was just costing them too much. You know, when they spent a million dollars for for uh, Bobby Hull and uh, Derek Sanderson, all those players, it didn't turn out real good. I mean, Bobby Hull did well, and but a lot of the deals fell through, and so they they stopped bidding the high money and you know not that i was going to get high money but uh the money wasn't there uh and then like you said uh teams the blues weren't in great shape at that time the solomons were getting out they had uh they were trying to get rid of it the year that i turned pro they had just uh signed bernie for Urko, and uh ross and perina was going through some money issues with the team so they didn't have a whole lot to throw around they had just hired Emil Francis, I think. So the Blues were, weren't even interested in signing me. So I signed with the Indianapolis Racers. Uh, had a really good camp. And uh, to your point, the coach back then, uh, Jacques Demers, really didn't know much about college hockey. Like I said, I had a good camp. I played well. Uh, he pulled me aside right before the season started, said, Mike, you know, we're going to send you down to the minors. You know, you played college hockey. There's not uh, not much hitting in college hockey. You only play 44 games. The checking isn't there. You know, you need to go down and uh, and this, it hurt me because I had a good camp and I was all American in my senior year. I was the most valuable player in the WCHA. My uh, cohort who played with me uh, at Michigan Tech made Hartford. He actually ended up uh, becoming the uh, rookie of the year. But here I am, sent to Mohawk Valley in the in the North American Hockey League. Basically, I lived slap shot for uh, <laughs> six months or so, or five months, whatever, until February when they brought me up finally. Yeah, and uh, when you played with Indianapolis, you also played for Edmonton, I believe, the Oilers and the WHA. Did you get to play with Wayne Gretzky at all? Had he signed with, with either of those? Because I know he played for both of those teams at one time. Well, there's a story of me going to uh, Edmonton. The the guy who I don't know if you if you've heard of Brian Conacher played yeah. in the NHL. Yeah. Uh, great guy. He was the I don't know if he was the owner, but he was the general manager. He drove the Zamboni. He did everything for <laughs> Mohawk Valley Comets. So he was there. Uh, got to know him real well. I scored a goal a game in 40 games or something in, in that league. So he knew I was a pretty good player. Uh, he respected college players. He, uh, him and I both went to Indianapolis at the same time. At the end of the year, um, Indianapolis was having money problems. So I got brought up to Indianapolis. He came up to be assistant general manager with Indianapolis. So he knew me real well. I played pretty good. Jacques Demers was still coach, so he still didn't enamor college players. So in the offseason, Brian Conacher became the general manager or assistant general manager with Edmonton. So he talked Glenn Sather into trading for me. And uh, that's when myself and Blair McDonald and uh, I think Dave Inkpen got traded to Edmonton in the off season. So I followed Brian Conacher there. 
and even Glenn Sather told me, you know, I, I had a, a pretty, uh, a so-so start, but I, then I, I came into my own and uh, sat down with Glenn Sather. I used to play backgammon with Glenn Sather on the plane. At one point, he said, Mike, when you came here, I had no idea who you were. <laughs> Brian Conacher said uh, to uh, make the trade, so I made the trade trusting Brian Conacher. Sorry, guys, my phone's ringing here. That's office. all right. I'll let it go. <laughs> Yeah, um, well, that that's great, and uh, that's not the first time that uh, that uh, Glenn Sather has trusted scouts or somebody else within the organization. Because when uh, everybody came to him uh, about Grant Fuhrer, he went and saw Grant play, and he went back to all of the scouts and said, "You guys are nuts. I don't want to. I don't want to sign Grant Fuhrer. He can't play. I think Grant gave up six or seven goals in a loss. Just played a terrible game." And uh, Glenn Sather's like, I don't want to. I, I don't want to draft him. I don't want anything to do with him. But just like any good general manager, he trusted his scouts. And look what happened. I mean, look what happened with you. You ended up in the NHL, and you've got to trust the people that work for you and the people you work with. Oh yeah, Glenn trusted. Uh, he wasn't. I don't know if he was around when I was there or not. But this uh, gentleman called Barry. I forget his last name. Uh, he was the one who basically drafted all those guys that that ended up being on the stanley cup teams and uh, yeah you got to be smart enough as you know this old saying is surround yourself with good people yeah uh, and uh, and that's what uh, that's what glenn did wow i just I, i'm still in awe i'm sitting here and, and, and you know i've talked to I've, I've talked to some but just the the era that you played in um so you you you're coming right in you started with the blues in 78 79 if i remember correctly and yeah, I I finished my my season in, in my my contract was a two year contract, so I finished my season in Edmonton. I actually led the team in scoring the last half of the year, and Glenn Sather came to me and like I said, they weren't throwing around money. No, um, I was making very minimal money, and Glenn Sather came to me near the end of the year, and said, "Mike, you're doing so well. Um, we're going to give you a thirty percent raise." Sounds good, right? But thirty percent of nothing is nothing. <laughs> <laughs> so I wasn't even in the ballpark then and kind of uh, disappointed me. It's kind of a slap in the face, to be honest with you. Yeah. And the, the Blues came to me at the same time. This is when they were just making their transition into Emil Francis were get, was changing the whole team over. Red Berenson yeah. retired, uh, got rid of a bunch of players, was bringing yep. new guys in, brought some guys in from the uh, – from Cleveland, Minnesota. I don't know if you remember, but that's when the teams uh, yep, the, amalgamated or whatever you want yep, to call it. That's whenever the Barons and the North Stars came together yeah. to become one team. Yeah. So we got Mike Crombie and we got uh, Ralph Klaas and yep. we might have got a couple other players. So there was a whole turnaround right there. Um, the Blues went from older players to younger players and he decided to put a bid in for me and his was about the same as uh, the Oilers. And I said, well, you know what? If Sather doesn't want me, doesn't want to treat me like that, uh, you know, treat me well. Uh, and that was the NHL versus the WHA. Sure. Yeah. So I, I took the jump. And uh, funny thing is, uh, you asked me about Gretzky. Gretzky, that, the year I went to St. Louis is the year Gretzky went to Indianapolis. Mm. And then he ended up going to the Oilers, you know, a few months after the season started. And he actually played the whole year with my line mates. Oh, really? Yeah. So my line mates who scored 30 goals with me scored 50 with him. So, you know. <laughs> yeah, I, I actually remember watching a video on a Saturday show late at night about the WHA and the NHL and how some of the teams were going to come to the NHL. And they were talking about this young, skinny, scrawny kid and and that some people compared him to Gordie Howe if he could get some weight on and he might be good and he, he could have a d good career. But uh, I don't think... I think there were a lot of people thought he'd be great, but there were some people that thought he was just way too small for the NHL game. Oh yeah, I mean there were a lot of skeptics. Uh, you know, I mean, what he, was he? 185 he, pounds no, dripping not wet. Once one seventy, one sixty five, maybe. Yeah, he was about that. He might have been six foot, but yeah, I mean he wasn't fast. Didn't have a hard shot. Didn't skate real well. Just did everything else. Yeah, unbelievably. You know? He was a very smart player, and I tell you what. With hard work and being smart and knowing the game, you can end up with a better career than a guy that's got a lot of skills and doesn't really care about the game. It's a lot of heart. Even now, yep. uh, you know, speed is good. Uh, skill is good. But to make it and stay, you have to have that uh, that X factor that yeah. 
that you you want to be there, you want to pay the price. I mean, you see stars that come into the league, uh, and uh, some of them just don't make it. You know, yeah. they don't they don't reach your potential. I mean, I, I think the the uh, question marks are out there, and I don't I can't speak to any uh, uh, expertise on it, but they're wondering about Line A. Line A is yeah. that how you say it? You know, yeah. there's skeptics in Winnipeg that said he didn't work hard enough, didn't back check. Uh, you got to play a full, a full, uh, you know, 180 foot game and uh, and be dedicated to it to become a McDavid and uh, a Marner and uh, uh, who's the guy, other guy in uh, Matthews. 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 Yeah. Sorry, guys. I, the, that's all right. Brain doesn't work too well once in a while. <laughs> yeah, that's a uh, that's a. Uh... Brett Hall even had to, you know, he finally figured out that uh, he had to be a little better defensively. He couldn't just be an offensive guy. He was never great at being a defensive guy and coming back on the back check or anything like that. But he realized it. uh, He finally won his cup because of it. He didn't score as many goals, but he finally won his cup in Dallas. And in today's game, you've got to at least be serviceable on the defensive side if you're a winger or a center. And it's just totally different than – the way it used to be a lot of times. But uh, one thing I was going to talk to you about, the thing that I miss is I got really upset as as a young person when they took all that room behind the goal with guys like you as a center and Bernie Federico used to stand behind that goal and have all that room and that open ice to find guys open. And they took that all away. And I remember being so disappointed when they did that. Yeah, I mean, it was I didn't do that much. But as to your point, Bernie did it a lot. Gretzky did it yep. uh, unbelievably. And uh, I'm not sure why they did that, to be honest with you. Yeah, it, 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 it was interesting that that even happened. It was a, a complete surprise. Now, I want to show you, I found this video of you while you were on the Blues. We talked about it already, so you already know about it. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring this video up. And I want you to talk about, this is a power play, power play. And you're in a different position. Like Lance talked about you normally being behind the goal. Here, I'll let you watch it and then talk about it. So let me bring that up. Hope you can see it okay, Mike? I can. I can. I actually found this video about two weeks ago. That's the first time I ever saw it. (laughs) Okay. And you know what? I need to – I made a mistake. I didn't put it to where the audio is on. So give me just a second. got to pull it off and redo it. So I apologize about that. Okay, so let me try this again. I apologize. Guy, you want me to walk you through this? (laughs) And here we go. This is Mike Liut. Mike Zook. Um, I'm not sure of the year. Mike Zook. Or Mike Zook. Oh, God. (laughs) Uh, he played with Lee. That's why it's on my mind. That's Mike right. Zook, Mike That's Zook right. on the power play. Here we go. Pass to the point. Nicoletti. Zook. Shot. Goal. <laughs> oh, it's a power play goal for the St. Louis Blues. Zook gets the goal. That'll bring one man out of the penalty box. The Rangers will still be shorthanded. So I'm guessing that was a five on three and uh, I'll let you talk about it, sir. Yeah. I mean, I played the point in the power play uh, a lot. Uh, luckily when I grew up, my dad put me on the, on defense sometimes. And actually there's one, uh, one time I never got off the ice. I played defense the whole game, but <laughs> so I, I learned, I learned that part of the game. I learned how to, and my dad, believed in skate, you know, being able to skate forward, backwards, you know, all the skills. So I was a good backward skater, um, played my backyard. So I got to learn how to play defensively, you know, on a three on three situation. So I wasn't a liability as a, as a defenseman. So I was point of power play in, in junior in college. And when I got to St. Louis, I played the point of power play. That was Joe McLeady who was my, uh, my partner at the time. And uh, the way I, I mean, I had a decent slap shot, but I had Brian Sutter usually in front of the net. And similar to today's game, uh, guys are always, uh, today they're always in front of the net. They can. Back then, guys didn't go in front of the net too much because you got beat up. 
And, you know, you stood in front of the net, a guy cross check you, spear you, punch you in the head. You Slash, look at the yeah, yeah. Yeah. And then you look at the referee, and the referee would say, hey, you're in front of the net. What do you yeah. expect? You know, that was the kind of attitude back then. So, but Brian Sutter was in front of the net. So I didn't worry too much about taking a big slap shot. All I worried about was getting the puck past the defender up up top and getting it on net. And there was either a screen, a rebound, or a tip. And I was I was pretty accurate with my shot. So I hit the net most of the time. So that's all that was. Even though I see that video now, nobody was in front of the net. Bernie was beside the net. But mm-hmm. I got low enough because it was a five on three that I was able to take a yeah. shot from the from the top of the circle. So that's that's what happened there. And yeah, and it's 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 true today, just like it was back then, even though the game's changed a little bit. Get the shot on goal, have guys in front of the net, something good will happen. You you you, yeah. you can't you can't score in, unless you shoot the puck. <laughs> no, no. And that's why somebody uh, I know you might want to talk about it, uh, the blues now, but that's that's why somebody like Krug is so valuable. And you know, he he's very good at getting the puck to the net. And he'll take a lot of wrist shots. Just, you know, just like we yep. talked about. Yep. I mean, yeah. I th- Petrangelo, in the start of his career, he couldn't hit the net. No, he couldn't. That's the no. thing that really bothered me. And he would put the puck off the glass. He, he put the puck eight to ten feet off the side, off the side, off the side of the net. And yeah. and me as a goalie, I'd be going, "How are you missing the net that much? Yeah, how could, how yeah. are you doing that?" And it used to drive me nuts. Not that I didn't like him as a player, yeah. but that was a part of his game that. He finally realized, I think, I don't know how it happened to feed yeah. himself or somebody talked to him or maybe Larry Robinson who came in, said something to him, but he started to get the puck on the net and became a very good offensive player. Yeah. And people, people used to ask me, you know, you've got to be nuts to be in goal and stand in front of a 95 to 98, hundred mile an hour slap shot. And I said, well, I really don't mind those if I can see them and nobody's oh, yeah. in front of me. I said, but in all actuality, a good wrist shot, from 15 to 20 feet out is going to give me sometimes more problems. It just depends on who's shooting it. And if they know where to put it, it's going to give me more problems than that slap shot would. Oh yeah. And nowadays you have probably two or three guys in front of a goal. I feel sorry for yeah. goalies now, even though oh, yeah. they're on, their skill now is unbelievable. Yeah. Uh, and they're they, all, and they're all big Mike back then you didn't have, I mean, you had guys like Harold snaps that were six, two, six, one, but yeah. they were all 190, 200 pounds. Today, every team has got at least two lines that are big. You know, they're oh, yeah. six, six, one, six, two, two, twenty, two, thirty. I mean, look at Tarasenko. He's a scorer, and he's six two or six three and two hundred and thirty pounds. These are big guys. Those big guys are hard to move out of the front of the net. Oh yeah, and and they can skate too. Yeah, that's the thing. The big guy when I played, you weren't too worried about. No, uh-uh. you could get around them or avoid them because he couldn't catch you. And now, I mean, these big guys, uh, they can skate as well as anybody. Yeah. And and a lot of them have really good hands too. Oh, absolutely, yeah. You're, there's no there's nobody in the NHL now that can't play uh, as a second line player. Yeah, you know, there's yeah. no fourth liner who can't play anymore. They, they yeah, can't yeah. Afford that. They can't afford that anymore. No, they can't. And and I remember one of the you know of course Howe was a big guy you know for his time especially he was built pretty well. Yeah. But I remember when Mario Lemieux came into the league and with his size and he could be physical and use his physical presence and people so no oh no he didn't he just used all his skill if you watch mario lemieux he used the whole package yeah and it's he, it's he always been sad to me yeah it's always been sad to me with all the back injuries that he had and everything people get upset with me i love wayne gretzky but even gretzky will say if um if he hadn't had if lemieux hadn't had all those injuries and could have played healthy and not missed half seasons he would have passed me up easily in points probably probably would have yeah, yeah, because he didn't play the same number of years, number of games that yeah. uh, Wayne did. And, and back then, I I don't know what the points per game uh, yeah. ratio was, but he was he was right there. Yeah, and 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 you guys, you guys played with no helmets. I mean, the first game I ever saw in St. Louis after we moved from California was in '76 or '77, and we played the Blackhawks and Keith Magnuson. I don't know if you remember Keith Magnuson. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, uh, he, uh, of course, half the guy, actually 90% of the guys didn't have helmets on. There was one or two guys with helmets on and we played to a zero, zero tie. There was no overtime. There was no shootout. It was just as, and it was one of the most physical games I have ever seen in my life up to this day. Yeah, it was crazy. I, I mean, I wore a helmet all along because I, I figured I had, I wore it in college 
you know, why take it off? Yeah. Uh, you know, I had concussions with a helmet, so if I didn't yeah. have a helmet on, I probably wouldn't be here right now. Yeah. yeah, I remember, I think Ron Duguay and a couple other guys, Harold Schneps may have been some of the last guys in McTavish to McTavish not have to was, wear a helmet. McTavish was the last guy here yeah. in St. Louis, and it was grandfathered. It was grandfathered in somewhere around 80, 81, 82, yep. 83, where if you didn't want to wear a helmet, you were in the league and you didn't want to wear a helmet, you signed a waiver. Yep. And then everybody else knew coming in had to wear a helmet. Yep. Just like yep. the visors are now. There's guys not wearing a visor because that was grandfathered yep. in. And then and every new player has to wear a visor. Yep. Well, with the game that you played, the physicalness of that game, what are some of the the – Toughest, hardest players you played against? Uh, well, back then, the, the 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 big tough guys you didn't worry too much about the John Wensix, the the Secord, the Nem. Not so much Secord because it, we had a rival with Chicago, so Secord would run you, you know, because yeah. he had to, and he was, you know, he was with Savard, and I used to play against him, so that was a guy you'd have to watch. Uh, guys that were really scary were the guys, for instance, like a Ben Wilson. You know, he was a tough guy, but he didn't care. He didn't, my, what I always say is he didn't know what he was going to do. So you didn't know what he was going to do. <laughs> <laughs> so you know, that, that was the guy you stayed away from. Yeah. I, I, I always look at guys like Bobby Clark and people go, man, he was so dirty. And I'm like, can you imagine him trying to get away with some of the stuff he got, he got away with back in the mid seventies? Oh, yeah. uh, oh. He'd been, he'd be in the penalty box, Mike, probably 30, 40 minutes a game. Oh yeah, he'd spear you at the face off, and I had to oh. I had to face off against him. So he was a guy you had to watch his stick for sure. Yeah, he 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 worked you over with the stick. That, that oh, yeah. he was very good at that. Because he had all the guys behind him. And- oh yeah. Well, in fact, I don't know if a lot of people know this, and I, I'm not trying to take over your show, guy. But hmm. one of the reasons that uh, Philadelphia got so physical was because of the Blues. Oh yeah, there's a documentary about that. Yeah, the owner of the Flyers said. Hey, every time we go into St. Louis, we're getting the crap beat out of us, and our skill ain't helping us. We're going to bring in guys that have some skill, but we're going to get heavy and physical, and it worked for Philadelphia. There was one game in particular that they highlight in this documentary where they were in Philadelphia, and the Blues uh, basically beat up the Flyers. They mm-hmm. weren't the tough, uh, you know, the Broad Street Bullies at the time, mm-hmm. and uh, Snyder, the owner president, whatever, came in the locker room after and said, there's never, ever going to be another time where somebody comes into our building and beats us up. So the, because of the blues, the, the Broad Street Bullies were born. Yeah, he meant it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think he started making changes within a day or two after that, moving guys in and bringing guys up and trading for guys and doing other things. He didn't wait too long to change it. Yeah, I don't know about the trades. You're, you're probably right, but I do know in the draft. That's the yep. year I think they drafted Kelly and uh, yep. Valeski and, uh, you know, three or four other tough guys. Yep. And they continue to do that. So they yep. built that team over two or three drafts, mostly tough guys. Mm-hmm. Well, I'm going to move back to the Blues a little bit. But, no, I, I'm just – I'm in amazement with these stories. I love them. <laughs> so you did get – you got to play with both Suter and Federko. Sorry, and. Yep. Yep. And, and Sutter, I say Sutter, Sutter, <laughs> Sutter, right. Sutter, and Federko, and a few others. What are some of your memories of playing with those guys? Or what do you, I'm, I'm sure they're still your friends now, so I don't, you know, if you've got stories, tell them what you can. But what was it like playing in those days? Well, it was fun coming into the into the Blues at that time because that's when we were growing. My first year, we didn't make the playoffs. And then every other year, we, we made the playoffs. Uh, that was our the start of the run of 25 years straight that the blues made the playoffs. And it was just fun. Every year we got better and better. And uh, there was one time, I think the year that Montreal Canadians lost 18 games and we went in there and beat them. <laughs> and uh, my job, our line at the time I came up, I was Barkley Plager. Uh, the great Barkley Plager was very kind to me. Uh, took me aside my first year and said, Mike, you're my best two-way player. You're going to you're gonna play against all the best lines. So I had to play against Lafleur, Shutt, and Lemaire, uh, the French Connection line, mm-hmm. uh, Dion's line in Montreal, or in, uh, in L.A. So we went into Montreal. I remember scoring two goals against Ken Dryden, playing against uh, Lafleur, Lemaire, and Shutt, and being a first star. And we, we beat them in Montreal. We, you thought we won the Stanley Cup. That was one of their 18 losses for the season. 
So we were on a team that was growing and building and getting better and better. And that led to the 80, 81 season. That was, a, you know, we, everybody had career years and we couldn't do anything wrong. And then uh, because of a few trades, a few guys not playing up to their best, uh, we never really got to the point where we were a Stanley Cup contending team. Yeah, and and you, like you said, players like uh, Dion, um, Marcel Dion, Dave Taylor of the Kings, yep. and uh, people, you know, people talk today about these guys being so talented, and they're so much better than guys were back then, and. And every player I've talked to said, hey, listen, if you can play hockey, you can play hockey. It doesn't matter if you were good in the 90s. It doesn't matter if you were good in the 80s. You could still be good in today's game, just like the good guys from today's game could be good in that style of game. Guys find a way. And it just, uh, like Guy said, we were looking forward to talking to you because you played for you played with so many guys when you left the Blues to go to Hartford. You played with Mike Lee and goal because he eventually ended up there. Yep. You played with Ron Francis. And that is one guy to me, if you want to talk about Ron, and I hope guy doesn't mind this, but Ron doesn't get the respect. If you look at his goals at all time, he's 29th, I think all time in goals. And I think he's somewhere around in the top 50 in points. He yep. was a great player. Ron Francis oh, was yeah. really good. Great hands could be a little physical and kind of push people around a little bit wasn't a big guy but he could give it back to you uh tell me a little bit about ron francis if guy doesn't mind no i, I mean I, let me go way back because he grew up in the sioux also oh and did he I told, I told you about my the rink in my backyard yeah, yeah. my dad coached ron francis and uh your little story i tell i tell parents this i tell coaches this all the time ron francis was a short chubby little <laughs> 14, 15 year old player playing for my dad. Uh, his mom was Italian, liked to make the pasta and everything. So Ron liked to eat the pasta. My dad took him aside. <laughs> well, first of all, he got picked. My dad saw the talent in him and uh, picked him on the team, even though he was short and I stubby, think he was a little chubby and slow. Yeah. Saw his talent, picked him. Parents used to always wonder why is Ron Francis on the team? Why is he playing? regular shit my dad used to always play everybody even you yeah. know uh he knew you know he had to help kids reach your potential sure and my dad you know never listened to the parents he just said you know to himself don't worry about it my dad took ron francis aside and said ron you know what i know your mother makes good meals and all that <laughs> but you got to push yourself away from the table a little bit <laughs> <laughs> and at the time ron francis lived uh a mile or so away from the ice rink where my, where they practiced. It was an indoor rink. Uh, Ron Francis used to walk to the rink in the wintertime. And his mom used to follow him in the car to bring his equipment. <laughs> and then after practice, Ron would come to my dad's ice rink and skated there all the time. So, and Ron went from being an average player in, in the Bantam next year in midget led the league in scoring. I think that maybe the next year, went to junior A, led the league in scoring, and then the next year was in the NHL. So in yeah. four years, Ron went from being a short, stocky, yeah, maybe it was five years or so, but went from a, a short, chubby, slow player into an NHL player and then Hall of Fame career. Yeah, he doesn't get the credit like players like uh, Dion or like Dave Taylor do, but uh, he was a guy I loved to watch. Even when he would come into the bar in the old arena there, I always loved to watch Ron Francis. Always yeah. love to watch him. What a trade uh, Pittsburgh made for France. Oh, yeah. Oh, Samuelson. The, I mean, that was a steal. Yeah, old and Samuelson for Ron Francis, there. and that kind of started them in the direction they needed to go. Yeah, there are the pieces. You can't yeah. just win with Mario Lemieux. You can't just nope. win with Yager. With yep. Yeah. You have to have a full complement, even back then. Back then, you needed three lines. Now you yep. need four lines. Yeah, and I've, I've heard people say that, that uh, he was a great teammate. And yeah. he, he worked well with other people. Like you said, he wasn't one of those guys that would stay off to himself. If if somebody asked for help, Ron Francis was going to give you the help that you asked for. Yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Right. Sorry, guy. No, no, no. I, I I love it. I love it. I'm sitting here. I'll, I'll, I'll do this all day long. I'll be the <laughs> I'll be the host that keeps his mouth shut, right? The host with the most. So we talked a little bit about it. So on the blues, I mean, you basically lived in St. Louis from 1978 on minus the three years in Hartford, but I think you kept your home in St. Louis. Yeah. While you were in Hartford, home and, right? and came back in the summertime. To yeah. Say. So 
you're you're much ingrained in St. Louis, and I've asked some other players this. Um, basically, north or south of Canada, St. Louis probably has the most NHL players of any city. Why do so many players come to St. Louis and stay there? What what is about the city that that captivated you so much? Well, it's a, I mean, first of all, being Canadian, you don't want to go back up to Canada <laughs> to the cold. So you know, if you can put up with 100 degree weather in the summertime, it's it's a great place to live. And there's good people. Um, the tradition is of, of hockey is here. And over the years, uh, as more players stayed, we helped develop the youth hockey. Community. Oh, yes. So, so any guy now, like a Nanny McDonald. Yep. Uh, Soupy Campbell, uh, you go on and on. Guys that had kids that played hockey. Jeff Here's Brown. Hockey, Jeff think. Brown, yeah. Yeah, Jeff Brown. Uh, yeah, the Basil Kachucks. McRae stayed here until his Yeah, the Kachucks. Uh, Kachu- I mean, a, a prime example is Peter Peter Stastny. Oh, yeah. I mean, he yeah. was a Quebec. He played in Quebec for yep. years and years. Yep. Great hockey town. Excellent. Great hockey for, for kids. Well, when we when Peter got here, youth hockey was decent. It was it was getting pretty yeah. good, yep. and the kid the boys were younger, and so Peter, even though he played what half a year or a year here, he it was about here. a half a year, three quarters of a yeah. year. He stayed here. Uh, Paul grew up. I remember watching Paul uh, when he was a mite, which is what seven, eight, nine years, eight old, years, yeah, eight years yeah. old, yeah, yeah. And uh, I tell people now, people you know, don't believe me, but I knew Paul Sasser was going to be in the NHL back then. I've 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 heard other people say that 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 had seen him. They said they. He had that work ethic, that that doggedness, like his dad had. And the but vision. he was, he yeah, has that and the vision. vision. That you can't really teach. I saw I, him it, go it's, in the corner. Yeah, those guys that are, are, are centermen, like like you were, you've got to have vision. You've got to know who's behind you, who's next to you, and some of those, the best centermen will make blind passes to guys, and you'll you'll just look at it and go. I mean, I've even been amazed playing the game and watch a centerman coming down on the wing with a puck. And it looks like he's going to shoot it, and all of a sudden he passes. And I'm like, I didn't think he's going to pass that damn puck. Yeah, that's something that's hard to teach. You can work on it, but it's a, it's a sense that yep. uh, great players have, good players have, most NHL players have it. Yeah. Uh, and uh, to your point, I, you saw the game last night. Yeah. And uh, he's not a centerman right now, but Cairo made that pass to um, who was it? Falk. 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 That was a play. If you watch that closely. He felt Falk yep. coming through there. Yep. Oh, and yeah. then as he turned, he really didn't see him. Yeah. But either he saw him in his peripheral vision or he knew he was there. He made that pass without looking at him. And that's what a great player. Yeah. Not just yeah. a good player makes a great player. So I'm very impressed with Cairo. Um there's, there's quite a few young guys on the on the blues that have yep. that. Yeah, and 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 you and, and you know what the the thing about it is is that they have the heart to play too. You can, yeah. I mean, I could tell when I would play against a team, if a guy loved the game or if a guy was just playing it because his parents wanted him to play it. Yeah. You, you, you can tell a guy that's just there for his parents because his dad played, you know, for Wisconsin university, made it up to the college level or, or played in junior a or junior B. And you can just tell that they're playing to be playing, yeah. but those, uh, you can yeah, tell those he, guys don't make it. Those guys no, they don't. don't. It. If they do make it to the NHL, it's for a cup of coffee. And right. uh, I wanted to get back to Quebec because I love the city of Quebec. I'm glad that Vegas got a team, but I'm going to tell you what Quebec city de- deserves a team. There are absolutely. So, I, I, I've talked yeah. to so many friends of there that I have. I've in a previous life, as I call it, I did a lot of business up in Canada, in Toronto, Vancouver, Ontario, Calgary, uh, Fort McMurray, Grand Prairie, uh, Toronto, so I'm very familiar with things that go on up in Canada. And uh, uh, they had so many season ticket holders ready to go that it signed five, six year contracts to buy tickets, but it was all about the money. And what concerns me, Mike, is that with the way the dollar is, the Canadian dollar yeah, and the U S dollar, it. it's going to take somebody probably from the U S and, and a group of people with deep pockets from Canada and the U S to put a team in Quebec but I hope you agree with me. That city deserves a team. Oh, no, they do definitely. Um, part of the problem is the corporate yep. uh, sponsorship up there. There's, so they have them in corporations to buy the luxury boxes and to spend the money. And, to and, the, city, and, and the city, probably not a lot of big ones. 
no, not anymore. And uh, the, the Canadian dollar, although the Canadian dollar is a little better than it was, it's still at what eighty percent. I think it's eighty three or eighty two. Yeah. Yeah. So between that and the corporate sponsorship, that's what's holding them back. And hopefully, um, who knows where the Canadian dollar is going to go? They need somebody. I mean, Ottawa. Quebec's a better city than Ottawa by oh, far. Oh yeah. Uh, I, I I I really like Ottawa. It's yeah. a beautiful city. Great museums. Great places to yeah, go. It is, yeah. But you know what? Yeah, I would rather, and I, 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 you know, I hate to say this against any fan base because there are fans in Ottawa that just love hockey. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, it's yeah. there's several towns up there, and people think I'm nuts. I've often said that Saskatoon could support a team, and people say, "Oh, it's not a big enough city." I go, "But you got to look at the cities all around it." Yeah. You know, there's there's a couple cities up there that deserve a team. Yeah, I'm I'm not sure about Saskatoon, but I, you know, Quebec definitely. Um, yeah, it's it's a it's a tough uh, tough way to make uh, make money now. I mean, yeah. you got to sell the jerseys, you got to have the luxury boxes, yep. and the, the parties, and the and the sponsors and whatnot, and the and the uh, viewership on TV and the the TV money, all of that uh, goes into it. Well, yeah, you, you just just think of all the guys that played up there, Joe Sackick. Oh yeah, uh, Darren Kimball. You had you had Guy Lafleur play up there. I believe Tom Barrasso before he played for Buffalo, if I'm not mistaken, played for Quebec. I might be wrong. Yeah, I don't know but, about that. But the, but there was a lot of uh, a lot of really good players that played in Quebec. Um, of uh, the bet the best. I mean, the one that people talk about all the time, number 88, Eric Lindros. He played yeah. in Quebec. Yeah. Uh, but uh, yeah, I guess we can get off that topic. But I just wanted to say I think the people in that city deserve it too. Oh, they do. They really do. No. I yeah. Well, I'm kind of glad you brought up Saskatoon because this brings me to my next question. That's actually so, one reason. That's actually one reason why I did it. <laughs> uh, well, see, you played in what I call, or you came up into the period, the one of the first dark ages for the blues. Um, this is uh, early eighties, 82, 81, 82, 82, 83. This is when Perina, Ralston Perina decides that they can't make money with the blues. They're right. running it like a business, not a sports franchise. Yep. And sure. because they ran it like a business, they were almost running it into the ground and, and, and it started to alienate the fan base a little bit. Um, and then they were reporting losses that were maybe not there. So you were there at that period. And what was it like for you in that period? And then right after Ornest buys it, they had this thing called the waiver draft and you ended up being part of that. So can you talk a little bit about that 82, 83 period? Well, getting back to the Ralston Perina era, um, Solomon's wanted to sell a team, couldn't find anybody. And uh, a gentleman by the name of Hal Dean, who was the head of Ralston Perina did it to basically save the, the team in St. Louis. Yeah, he did. Yeah, they, they knew they weren't going to make money. They, they weren't so interested back then. Ralston Perina. And uh, then what happened was uh, they were losing money. They were, it was okay with Hal Dean there, but then Hal Dean was ousted or yep. retired. And the gentleman who came in was an accountant. Yep. He was so, a bean counter. Yeah. Bo yeah. Bottom line is he looked at the, the numbers and said, this is a, a money loser. Mm -hmm. We can't keep this. So, and they ended up turning it over to the, when nobody wanted to buy it, they didn't turn it over to the league. So yep. the league yep. was running it. Yep. And then Ornes came in, got it at a discount, was smart enough businessman to realize he could make some money and bought the arena for next to nothing. And, mm -hmm. you know, three, four, five years later, he sold it and made a, a healthy profit. Yeah. And there are a lot of people that I have arguments with in this city that say Harry Ornes was the worst owner ever. But I keep reminding them that, hey, for about six to eight months, the league owned this team. Yeah. And if it wasn't for Harry Ornest, they may have moved to Saskatoon, or if not Saskatoon, they may have moved to a different city. Harry Ornest, in my mind, he may not have been the best owner ever, but he saved the Blues for the city of St. Louis. He really he did. And I, yeah. Yeah. And and I I I know a few people. Uh, a, a a guy that worked with my dad, his wife was one of the executives for Austin Perina in the early '80s, and she said that. Uh, um, there were, she was one of the people that had a vote on whether to try to sell the blues. And she said they were outvoted by either one or two votes by the, by the members of the board. There were still people on that board 
that knew how important the blues were, regardless of what kind of money. But like you said, the head guy, and I forget his name, he was a bean counter and everything was how, uh, you know, this we're losing money. We're not giving our shareholders uh, any dividends on right. this. And yep. he just didn't, he looked at it as, as another business and it just wasn't, but I love Harry Ornest for what he did. He saved the blues. Yeah, he did save it and he knew how to make money. Yeah. He knew how to save money too. I got to. Yeah, he did it. because I, because if, uh, and I'll, I'm going to chime in real quick here, guy. Um, everybody talks about how bad the arena, what shape it was in, in the nineties before they built, uh, uh, what's now the enterprise center. Uh, and, uh, I will tell you this, um, I've t I took tours of that as a young child, probably 12, 13 years old in 82 and 83, and that building was falling apart, and there was rats down in the tunnels, and oh, yeah. it, 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 I really felt sorry for you guys because you did not have a top-notch place to play, but you know what I loved about that? Um, when I didn't, when I, when my dad didn't get the, the, the tickets for the games where we sat right behind the goal to where the opposite team shot twice. Um, we had first row and second row seats. Um, I always set up in the yellow seats up top. And the way those yellow seats were, they were like almost inverted down to where it felt like you were falling towards the ice. But it was such a view. That place was so loud. I was there for the Monday Night Miracle against Calgary. It was a great place to have fans watch a hockey game. Oh, yeah, it was it was great. I did I had no problems. We I mean, our, we had a, a big locker room. Yeah, you did. Fancy or anything, but oh. it was uh, it was big enough, and uh, somehow or other they kept the rats out. Or I didn't see the rats in the locker room. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But uh, <laughs> yeah, it was, and then uh, I don't think Ornest put much money into it. No, he didn't. Uh, no. I'll tell a funny story how he saved money or made money, uh, and Bernie Federico tells me the story because I was I was picked up in the waiver draft yeah. before the season. Yeah. Um, Instead of flying direct, and back then most of the flights were commercial. Yep. Instead of let's say instead of flying from St. Louis to Pittsburgh for one hundred and eighty dollars a person, they would book flights from St. Louis to Dallas to Atlanta to Pittsburgh to save twenty bucks. Yep. Yep. They used to drive the, the instead of getting there instead of leaving at eight o'clock and getting there at ten, they would leave at eight o'clock in the morning and get there at six o'clock at night. Yeah. To save yep. twenty bucks a person. Yeah, I've, I've heard other players. I've heard other players tell that story. Yeah, that, that's drive great. The players crazy. And then what <laughs> I heard too that year in '85 when they lost to that lost yep. to um, Calgary. Yep. They didn't have flights home. '86. Yeah, they didn't have flights home. They the guys had to figure out how to get home themselves. That's crazy. Isn't that nuts? <laughs> that's nuts. Can you imagine? Can you imagine what players would do today? At, or oh, yeah. or even the NHL front office would do if a player called him and said, "My team's refusing to fly me home." Yeah, uh, yeah, it, it wouldn't fly. It, a yeah. totally different era. <laughs> yeah, it was. Yeah. Well, it, well, along with that, I know that you are a huge Blues fan. Yes, yeah, I know you watch the games. Uh, we've, I mean, we were watching the game last night together, and that was, right. I, 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 that was a huge thrill for me. That twenty minutes that we spent watching that third period, uh, I, I got to tell you, I learned. I I consider myself a knowledgeable hockey fan. Just listening to you for a few minutes, I learned stuff. So I, I appreciated that. Yeah. I want to talk a little bit about the 19, 18, 19 Blues and them winning the Cup. For you being someone who played with the team, who's lived and died with that team, what did that mean to you personally? I was like a lot of the, the fans that I saw. I mean, I cried when they won. I mean, the way they did it and – I felt so happy for the fans and the cities because there are diehard fans. Uh, I'm, I'm getting to meet more and more of them now. I, my business is selling, uh, uh, apparel. I'm selling yep. jerseys now. I, I, I sell Jersey cases and I'm, I'm meeting, uh, meeting more and more of the diehard fans. I've been into like five man caves, you know, cause what, <laughs> what I do is when I sell a Jersey, I don't ship it to them. I either bring the person to uh, our new uh, alumni room so mm -hmm. they can see the, the room or I'll come to their house and deliver it to them. And I've been down in these man caves and it's just amazing, the fans. And I knew that going in, I'm finding out more and more about it, but it, I was just so happy for the, for the people. And, and I mean, the team, you know, I told Alexander Steen, I was happiest for him that they won the cup because he was, he's been here forever and worked his butt off and 
He's he he is a great player. I don't think he got the credit he did he should have as a player for the Blues. But uh, I was I was just uh, very emotional about them winning. Yeah, I haven't heard. Uh, yeah, I I haven't heard um any former Blue that I've talked to that have said that they didn't tear up a little bit because it's like Guy said. There's some reason why players stay around here. Uh, yeah. It's 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 not just because the the the, the schools are good for their kids. Um, I, since I've been to Canada a lot, St. Louis reminds me of some of the cities in Canada where people are just so nice yeah. and so so down to earth. And I think that's why people 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 stay here after the career's over. Yeah, well, I mentioned the hockey for the guys, but it's it's the people, it's the city, it's the opportunities. Um, and uh, what I tell people is they love their players, whether you're Brett Hall or you're a Mike Zoo. You know, they love their superstars, but they, they appreciate the guys that worked hard and 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 uh, sweated and uh, and bled for the for the for the St. Louis Blues. And uh, it makes you feel good and makes you be want to stay in the in the city. Yeah, there's a lot of times people will send me direct messages on Facebook and Twitter, and uh, they'll send me emails. And want me to talk about older players that, that you know may have played eight minutes a game. Uh, guys today like uh, um, uh, uh, Mackenzie McEachern, guys on the fourth line, and they want to know more about them, and they want to talk more about them than than Cairo and Thomas and and O'Reilly. They want to talk about those guys, and it just I, I I've always called it a lunch pell city. It's the it kind is. of yeah, yeah the, the, they like the they love their stars. Don't get me wrong, they love Brett yeah. Hall to death. Uh, but they like those guys that bring it every night. They work their butts off. Uh, they may not be the most talented, but but because of their hard work, they make things happen. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I mean, I'll, I'll tell you a prime example of that right now is Justin Falk, right? Oh, yeah. yeah. When he came in last year, I, I don't know what it was. He, I, he just he didn't fit the system. He didn't. I can tell you. Not. I can tell you what it was, guy. He, he was I on the wrong. Theory too. He, he was on the he was on the wrong side. He was playing his offside on defense. And a lot of people think, oh, you can go to the right side or the left side defensively and you can make a quick transition. It's different. It's, it's different. totally different. And once he's on the, his side th this year, he's got more confidence. And I told people, and you did too, guy before the season that watch out for Justin Falk because he's oh, no, on I, his I normal side. It. Yeah. Well, I, I've seen it. You got to add to that too, the mental part of it. Yeah, it is. Yeah. He comes into a team that won the Stanley Cup, mm -hmm. pressure's on to not screw up so to speak you know don't hurt that um he was not he was the number one guy in carolina yeah he came in he was not the number one defenseman he nope. certainly wasn't the number one power play guy yeah. and the pressure was there and he didn't get the minutes didn't get the quality minutes and playing off wing now all of a sudden petrangelo's gone uh krug kind of replaces him a little bit but not on the right side not on the power play so he's now reaching that level that he was in Carolina with us. I mean, I didn't yeah. know him from Adam. I thought yeah. he had kind of a disappointing season. Nothing, I don't blame him for anything at all. But he didn't live up to the hype that I heard and the player he was. People now that uh, said how good a player he was and are saying it again, saying that he's playing up to his capabilities and, his, and what he was in Carolina, that's all he's doing now. It was a tough yeah. season for him. Coming in as was he even number two or number three? Yeah, you know, yeah I think like the guys we had, four or five defensemen. Yeah, you had Bo Meester, you had uh, yeah. um, Branko. Our young guy Franco. I mean, those are guys that you know. And he's a, it sounds like he's a guy that wasn't just going to step in and say, "All right, I'm number one yeah. or number two. He was almost like number four in the mm -hmm. pecking order, so to speak. Yeah. And that's tough when you're the star on a defense uh, for Carolina. Yeah. yeah. Well, the, the thing that, I, that I've noticed, and, I, and, and Lance is right, and I t kind of talked about this, and, and I had Darren Pang on on my birthday, and I said I thought putting Justin Falk with, with Krug or um, even with Pareko maybe or, or just kind of letting him play around or find his game, that he was going yeah. to be a Norris levels defenseman. I got laughed at. I'm not getting laughed at anymore. I did too, yeah. Well, the NHL, I, I watch NHL Network all the time. And one of the guys there, they were rating the uh, rating the players, rating the forwards, rating the yeah, defense. yeah, yeah, yeah. And Falk and uh, Krug were rated the number one defensive partners 
right now. They were like yeah. uh, nine goals for and zero against. Yeah, at yeah. The time. I think so. Yeah. And then they rated, and then they brought another um, pundit on who's going to rate our, for the rest of the season. What's going to be the number one pairing? And he picked the, the same two guys, yeah. which said a lot. Yeah. I mean, really said a lot. Yeah, the, I, I think um, Krug is is starting to mature into the player that we saw in Boston. Um, yeah. And he's doing it a lot quicker. And I think he's doing it a lot quicker because Falk is taking some of the pressure off him. Like yeah, about. absolutely. Sure. Yeah. Right. yeah, he's getting used to the system too. And some guys, you know, people will tell me, especially if you didn't play the game, it's just hockey. Uh, no, if you go to one system and another system, uh, the the defensive scheme and what is expected of guys on certain positions can be different. And it takes a little time to get yep. that done. And like you said, Falk was a little nervous, didn't want to screw things up. And he's on his normal side now and, and crew come over. And you can just tell when the guys start getting confidence. You can see it in the way they skate. You can see it in the way they see the game. When a guy starts seeing the game, that's the first thing that I notice. Yeah. And I wouldn't doubt Baruby or one of the coaches took Falk aside and say, all right, now, you know, we know you had a good season. Petrangelo's gone. You're our guy now. Yeah. And that means a lot. Oh, sure and it does. Like I said, when Barkley, Barkley Plager, we were in practice. He put his arm around me and said, Mike, you're my number one guy. I'm going to play you against this guy, this guy, this guy, and this guy. When I went on, got on the ice, I'd go through the wall for him because he gave me yeah. the confidence that, and I didn't want to let him down. I didn't yeah. want to let the yep. fans down, the team down. But yeah. Barkley Plager putting that um, confidence in me wanted me to go through the boards for him. Yeah, and all the good players, all the guys that that work hard, when a coach gives them that thumbs up and says, you're my guy, they don't okay. want to disappoint. They, they, want to, they don't want to disappoint the fans. No. And they don't look at it as, oh, my God, there's all this pressure on me. The good no. ones think, okay, no problem. Yeah, I mean, it's, we're, the guys that make it to the top in any sport are, are special in how they, you know, their skills and how they view things. But uh, they're human beings too. But you take that pressure and you, you turn it into a positive. And if you turn it into a negative, I mean, like I said, we're the mental part of the game is huge. Oh. And a lot of the yeah. guys, most of the guys that make it have that mental capacity to succeed. And uh, that's why a lot of them are successful after they get out of hockey because they have that drive to succeed. Well, you know, Lance and Mike, I, I, I'm telling you, I, I sat here and this is the least I've ever said on a show, but I've learned the most. <laughs> I'm, and, sorry. And I, I'm sorry. No, no, no. I appreciate every bit of it. It's nice to sit back and listen. And Mike, we could probably talk to you for hours upon hours upon hours. Yep. So I haven't even what told I, you about slap shot in the minors yet. Next time. Yeah, I know. Yeah, I mean, I we got to. So, so what, what I'm going to do, Mike, I'm going to ask you to promise us and say two or three weeks, we'll do another one of these. If you're, if you're up to it. And um, now that we figured the technical side out, I think it should be much easier. <laughs> and, and, and Mike, it has been an, absolute thrill sir to well, talk to pleasure. you and, yeah. and, and I'll, I'll tell you what i'd love to do uh one time you and me get on one of these and just watch the game together i mean even though we're 4300 miles apart because i'd love to hear how you watch the game because i i just know just watch you yesterday what i was picking up it was amazing no i'd love to i'd love to i i enjoy this i enjoy uh talking about the blues doing anything to help the blues and uh for fans and, you know, people like yourselves. Now I got well, one thing to show you before I go back. So Lance, I'll let you talk real quick okay. and then I'll be right back. Yeah. It's, it's been an honor for me too. Like I said, I've talked to other players, some of them hall of fame players, some of them guys like you that had good careers, you know, but they're not hall of fame players. And, and uh, you know, I've also had conversations with professional football players. They're nice. Um, uh, MLB players, they can be nice. But to the T, I have never had an interview or spent five minutes with a hockey player, especially those from Canada, that they're not that, that they're just so down to earth. It's it they're just normal people whose parents worked their butts off. They got up at five in the morning, took them to practice. A lot of them worked on farms. They worked before they went to school. They worked after they you know they got home from school and then went to play the games. But it's been an honor to talk to you, and uh, I greatly appreciate it. And I hope Guy and myself uh, especially get to uh, talk to you again. And thank you so much for your time. We've went a little bit over. We've been an hour, 
but it's been an honor and a pleasure. And like I said, I always watched you as youngster and I always appreciated what you did for the city of St. Louis, the blues. And of course, with you uh, opening a business here in the St. Louis community. I appreciate it, Lance. You're muted, guy. We can't hear you. Hold on. Sorry. There we we can go. hear you now. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you go ahead. Okay. All right. <laughs> um, you get you do you have any uh you know you played with Mike Lee, you played with Ron Francis, you played with a lot of good players. Um, do you have any good Mike Leut stories? Because I know I got to see his first game, I got to see Federico's first game, I got to see Brian Setter's first game. Uh, and I probably got to see your your first game too because I seen every game like I said for five six years with especially during with the time you were there and especially that eighty eighty one season I believe it was when you played uh, Pittsburgh in the first round and Greg Miller and then three. you guys played the Rangers in the in the second round and lost but uh, um, Mike Leute, uh, you know he's such a nice guy I know that the the guy has talked to him. But uh, it, it, explain to some people that don't understand what goaltenders like myself are. It takes a different breed. They're not wired the same as, as you guys, you forwards and you defensemen, are they? No, no. Mike <laughs> was very, very confident player when he came in. Yep. It's, it's funny. We, uh, we used to call him a clubhouse lawyer. You know, <laughs> no disrespect or anything, but, you know, he liked to talk. He liked to say his opinion. And sure enough, he becomes a lawyer down the yeah. road. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I mean, he came from he came from the Cincinnati Stingers, I think, is yeah. where he came from. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, he's uh, ama amazing guy. Sorry about my mic. It's really sensitive. <laughs> so I have this jersey that I picked up off the internet and I showed it to you earlier. Um, it has your signature on it. Right. And I'm hoping yeah. Right. I'm hoping that I can get into St. Louis and get you to re-sign this for me. Absolutely. Uh, we'll take you right. to the um lose alumni room because it's, it's oh it's, you know that would be that would be an absolute thrill to me um what bruce affleck has done with the online alumni in the in the city great and, job and, great and job. what he's done he's helped me a lot i i will say that um i know i, I i've gotten to know him and, and just what you guys all do for the city and the team it's it, it's a pleasure and, and like i said mike I, I i don't even want to stop this i want to just keep talking and talking but i know you've got stuff to do and, and I will say this. I want to get one of those jerseys from you. Uh, when I come back home, we'll figure out a way that I can afford it, and we'll, we'll take care of that. But, Mike, again, this is an honor, sir, to, right. to make you, and, and, and I hope that I can use this word to call you a friend. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I enjoyed it, and uh, let's do it again. Yes, sir. So, right. uh, Lance, um, We've got another show to do, my friend. Yep, we do. We'll set something up with Mike here, let's say, towards the end of February, okay. beginning of March, and see how the All Blues right. are doing. And, and we'll get, in fact, in that show, we'll get Mike to, to help us break down the Blues, say, about the halfway point. Yeah. So, yeah. so in about 14 more games, we'll bring you back on, Mike, and have you help us break down the halfway point of the Blues. Yeah, and Mike, uh, I would also like to get down to your store, too, when all this COVID stuff stops and this weather and, and check it out. And hopefully you can be there and uh, – uh, kind of show me around. Uh, that'd be great if I could do that. Absolutely. That's uh, we'll connect. Sounds oh. good. And thanks right, again. No thanks so much for your time. And we look forward to talking to you in the future. All right. Talk oh, yes. So this is Guy, the Hawaii Blues fan, saying, oh, my God, what a show, what a show. And and I'm – I I, I I can't – I haven't stopped smiling. I, I didn't even smile this much with, uh, with um, Darren Pang. It's just – because I remember – are you saying I amuse you? Yeah, oh. is that what you're saying? Are you saying, are, are you saying <laughs> I'm getting that? Are, are, are you saying that he's there for for your comical amusement? Is that what you're saying? Uh, oh, you. Sorry, guys. That's a whole other show. Yeah. <laughs> so this is guy, a wide loose man, saying aloha, mahalo, and you got to know, guys, I am bleeding blue with you. And I'll catch you on the next Blue Note Fan Report. Stick around, guys.